Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Case. Uh, my pronouns are they and them, uh, and I'm one of the conference organizers. I'm going to be introducing the speakers and then organizing the Q&A period. Uh, first of all, though, welcome. Uh, we're really, really excited for this. Um, I think it's this is going to be an incredibly cool panel. Uh, with some really interesting discussions of solarpunk literature and media. Uh, we're going to start with Claire Watt discussing some solarpunk precursors. Uh, then we're going to move to a more narrow discussion of Becky Chambers' monk and robot duology, specifically through the lens of climate anxiety. And that's going to be given by Lika van Bynen. Bynen. Uh, and then ending uh, with Cheyenne Chatterjee, who will be giving a wider focus talk on solarpunk literature in relation to politics and activism. With that said, uh, and without further ado, uh, let's jump into it. Uh, we're going to start with Claire Watt. Uh, Claire Watt is a PhD researcher at Cambridge University, studying the, poly the poetics of protest and its an intersection with film, music, and the environment. She's, a, she's currently a Weiner and Spock Fellow at the ULB in Brussels, working on beat poetics with Dr. Franca Balarsi. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Claire. Hello. Hey. Okay. So thank you for having me in this panel. Um, I'm starting off as um, an exploration of the precursors to solar punk. So my talk is entitled Exploring Precursors to Solar Punk in US Literature and Film. Um, my name is Claire Watt and I'm a second year PhD student at Cambridge University. I'm studying American poetry and film and this year in particular um, I'm working on the Beat Poets in a fellowship at the ULB in Brussels. I've been interested in the solar punk genre for a while and the more I've been studying the beats this year, the more I've noticed um, resonances with these avant-garde American poets and filmmakers with what we see in solar punk today. So this talk, oh, I've got a thing pop up. Um, this talk will explore the precursors to solar punk, particularly focusing on the American beat poets. Okay. So background, the beats and beyond. Um, my presentation will focus on precursors to solar punk. Where did solar punk come from? Did it only exist in the internet era? Um, instead, I'm going to locate the origins of solar punk in the pre-internet era in US film and literature, looking particularly at the work of the beat poets. Examining the eco-anxiety and eco-optimism of the 1960s, 70s and 80s, I will demonstrate how solar punk growing as a genre for many years, only recently released into being by the emergence of the internet. Understanding the roots of solar punk will help us better understand where we are today. In particular, it will become clear that optimism and self-reliance of solar punk has been gradually building since our first awareness of the climate crisis. Of course, the beats are not the only precursors to solar punk, and I've included some other ones here in the pictures. Um, there are also many important resonances for the hippie movement, the punk movement, and early hip-hop. In terms of the hippie movement, we have the embrace of nature and a turn to viewing nature as that which should be protected by humans. Um, the hippie movement also held an optimism which preached peace and love, which chimes with the optimism of solar punk. Whilst the punk movement was less optimistic per se, Daniel Kane has made clear in his seminal book, Do You Have a Band?, that the punk musicians in New York City in the 1970s were bold in their creation of a work in a decaying city and they're stepping outside of the mold and of mainstream culture to live an alternative lifestyle. The sense of rebellion can be seen in the solar punk movement today. In a similar way, early hip hop artists of the 1970s demonstrated a self sense of self reliance by holding their own park parties and starting a rebellious bricolage like music genre from scratch. And got a hip hop party. Um, but before all of these important precursors came the beat poets who began writing in the 1950s and arguably laid the foundation for the countercultural youth revolutions of the 1960s and 1970s. Um, you probably know a bit about the beat poets, um, but basically they dedicated themselves to finding a new vision for how to live in America, pitting their poetry against mainstream capitalism and consumer culture. They were dedicated to self-reliance, optimism, and living in commune with nature and each other. As such, they represent a key pre precursor to the solar punk genre, which is taught law. And um, of course, the beat poets are not exactly in line with the solar punk genre that we see today. So I just want to make clear that there are key differences. Um, I'm only outlining their poetry as precursors. 
These key differences exist between the beat poets of solar punk, including how the beat poets looked less to revolutionizing the future than the present, and how they did not tend to include technology in their utopian visions of working with nature. Instead, technology was broadly viewed as a negative force, which needed to be resisted. Although Ginsberg experimented with tape with technology, many of the films, uh, many of the beats experimented with film technology. Their optimistic images of man and nature tend to take man away from the city and include separatist visions of mankind in common with nature. This is not to say that they would have been averse to solar punk genre as we see it today, only that they conceptualized nature and mankind <clears throat> interacting in a different manner. So with that kind of um, caveat out of the way, these are the key kind of different uh, similarities that I see that help me place um, the beats as a precursor to solar punk. So the first is mind expansion. The beat poets were important precursors for solar punk in their rejection of mainstream thinking and their sense of thinking outside of the box. They rejected capitalist and consumer culture and sort of said to expand their minds through nature and by looking to other cultures amongst other things. As Kerouac explained in his Essentials of Spontaneous Prose, the beats were trying to get to a new type of writing which mirrored how people actually thought breaking down the fabricated mental barriers constructed by American society. A large part of the Beats' connection with solar punk is the way in which they connected together different philosophies which had not been previously explored in tandem through religious and philosophical syncretism. The Beats wanted to push back the frontier of the mind and were one of the first groups to explore syncretic thinking, taking elements of Eastern and Western philosophy and mixing them together. Um, in Ginsberg and that's Alan Ginsberg and Wardman's poetry and film, for instance, they pursue a philosophy of connection between both mind and body, as well as the world, which sees mankind and the natural world as connected and interdependent. The pursuit of a mind-body continuum is a convergence of their aesthetic and religious philosophies as they attempt a reunification of body and mind. Embedded in their Buddhist worldview, they see a loosened boundary between self and other, the outside and in which connects them more closely to nature and enhances their sense of eco-responsibility. As per Olson, they, quote, get rid of the lyrical interference of the individual as ego, end quote. They attempt the egoless or Zen no-self informed by Buddhism. In Buddhist thinking, all things are interconnected. Quote, nothing exists in and of itself, nothing is able to stand alone. To believe that anything, whether it be a person, a material object, or an idea, exists autonomously, without depending on anything else, is ignorance. And this ignorance is a cause of all suffering in the new universe, end quote. This is an important precursor to turn away from self-serving capitalism and the possibility of working with nature seen in solar punk today. Indeed, many of the beats started to think about themselves and their writing in tandem with nature in more literal terms, modeling their writing on ecological processes. In Scratching the Beat Surface, which provides an insider's view of the beat scene of the 50s and early 60s and a new perception of art as a living bioalchemical organism, Michael McClure writes, quote, I wanted to say how I was overwhelmed by the sense of animism, how everything, breath, spot, rock, ripple in the tide pool, cloud and stone, was alive and spirited. It was a frightening and joyous awareness of my undersoul. I say undersoul because I did not want to join nature by mind, but by my viscera, my belly. The German language has two words, Geist for the soul of man and Odom for the spirit of beasts. Odom is the undersoul. I was becoming sharply aware of it. In one of the essays accompanying fast speaking woman, I is another, Dispative Structures, Anne Waldman, another beat poet, ascribes all of her writing to the influence of Ilya Prigoni's theory of dispative structures. Dispative structures are structures in the natural world in which expected order is constantly dissipated. The structures repeatedly bifurcate and from expected trajectories and create temporary order and temporary identities. A typical example of a dispative structure in nature is a hurricane, for instance. Waldman writes, all living things are dispetive structures. I am a dispetive structure. 
a flow into flowing apparent wholeness, highly organized, but also always in process. Applying this to the potential of poetry, she writes, the continuous movement in a structure results in new fluctuations, which is how I characterize the actor event of extending the writing back off the page. This links Wardman's poetry to nature, claiming that it mirrors the natural world. And by mirroring nature in this way, beat poetry and film takes its inspiration from structures in nature and works with it, not against it, in the manner of the cyberpunk genre. This also puts much of the beat work, of beat work, which already engages with ecological issues, in line with the category of eco-poetics, in which Rona Crown notes, quote, certain poetic methods model ecological processes like complexity, non-linearity, feedback loops, and recycling, end quote. We also have a picture of William Barrow's cut up here, um, which is important, but we're going to come back to that more later. This picture here is Kerouac's um, scroll where he literally wrote everything that he was thinking at an exact moment and then made that into On the Road. Self-reliant optimism and community. The beats are also an important precursor to Solarpunk in their self-reliance and creation of a separatist communities of beatniks which represent an optimistic view of the future. In both Kerouac's On the Road and the Dharma Bums, he characterizes an optimistic vision of life on the road, living a life of voluntary poverty and travel outside and in communion with nature. Jaffe Ryder, who represents the epitome of the Dharma Bum type for the narrator, Ray Smith in the Dharma Bums, has a vision of an America of, quote, a world full of rucksack wanderers, Dharma Bums refusing to subscribe to the general demand that they consume production and therefore have to work for the privilege of consuming. All that crap they didn't really want anyway, such as refrigerators, TV sets, cars, at least new fancy cars, certain hair royals and deodorant and general junk you finally always see a week later in the garbage anyway. All of them imprisoned in the system of work, produce, consume, work, produce, consume. I see a vision of a great rucksack revolution. Thousands or even millions of young Americans wandering around with rucksacks, going up to mountains to pray making children laugh and old men glad, making young girls happy and old girls happier. All of them Zen lunatics who go about writing poems that happen to appear in their heads for no reason, and also by being kind, and also by strange, unexpected acts, giving visions of eternal freedom to everybody and to all living, living creatures." End quote. This connects with the values of solar punk, which opposes capitalism, consumerism, and eco-fascism, amongst other things. Reese William character, Williams characterizes solar punk as standing, quote, against a shitty future, end quote, which Kerouac imagines here in his vision of kindness, not just between men, um, but also between man and the natural world. Yet Kerouac's idea of revolution is embedded in that of the separatist community, not including the entirety of mankind, which retreats from the city instead of revolutionizing it. In the Dharma Mums, he shows the life of Ray's friend, Sean Monaghan, as an ideal depiction of society um, working in tandem with nature. Sean and his wife live in a commune where they live off the land and um, in tandem with nature. And it, yet again, it is never implied that it would be possible to get the entire society to live in this way. Despite this, the depiction of an eco-revolution in Carrick's novel is still a precursor to the thinking of solar punk, as these separatist societies represent a microcosm of what could be possible for the entirety of mankind. So my final kind of connection here is the belief in the possibility of change. The beats also importantly show a belief in the possibility of change and that their actions can affect change in the real world, which is an important precursor to the defiant optimism of solar punk. Their philosophy is not just for leisure, but for revolution. A good example of this is a cut-up technique of William S. Burroughs, which was designed to wake up readers and wider society. Burroughs developed the cut-up technique in which fragments of text are, quote, removed from their original context, and the ordering of the fragments creates a surreal sequence of images, which, despite the lack of connection, combine curiously well and reveal a great deal about the source materials, end quote, alongside Brian Gissing in the 1950s and 1960s. By cutting and splicing the various texts at random in cut-up, patterns and underlying ideas and repetitions are revealed. The cut-up technique was originally inspired by montage and visual media, and Burroughs himself experimented with cut-up in film, most notably creating experimental films of Anthony Balk. 
For Burroughs and Gissing, the purpose of Cut Up was to decondition the reader and to remake reality, calling into question assumptions about narrative continuity and language. Gissing stated that his goal in creating Cut Ups was, quote, to create works that would affect the audience through simula simulation of multiple senses and by altering their thought processes and perception in some way, end quote. The Beats were interested in changing the perceptions of their audiences and inducing real change in the world with an optimism which reflects that of the solar punk genre today. Here we have on the right hand um, a screen grab from Anne Waldman's film Uh Oh Plutonium. So this is another example of the Beats attempting to wake up society. Um, the film protests plutonium pollution and engages in exorcism in which plutonium is removed from the environment. This is a poetic exorcism. Um, highlighting Waldman's eco-anxiety before solving it herself through words. Waldman's aim in her film is to wake up her viewers to the pollution around them and expel its influence. Sorry if I pronounced this incorrectly. The critic Encarnacio Cadeno writes that Waldman is trying to, quote, oppose the radioactive glow of plutonium with the metaphorical enlightenment of social and political awareness. And intends to quote the link uh, intends to rid, rid the viewer of quote the links established between economic profit and human and ecological destruction end quote so we also have here on the left um the cover of Ginsberg Wichita Vortex Sutra which was an anti-Vietnam war poem and um, that he wrote in prior to Waldman's um uh -oh, plutonium but both um, Waldman and Ginsberg are interested in the effective power of words in both their written and performed poetry and their film ventures. Throughout her, their oeuvre, both Waldman and Ginsberg engage with shamanistic chanting, incantation and mantra, steeped in the Buddhist and mystic traditions. They believe in the power of the word to enact change, and their work often shows the transformative potential of words, with Waldman considering poetic formants a, quote, ritualized event in time, end quote. They both play with a mixture of magical and mystical resonances. In mantra, one may chant sacred utterances, which in Buddhism are believed to possess mystical or spiritual efficacy. Repetition of mantra can induce a trance -like state and lead the participant to higher spiritual awareness. Other types of mantra can supposedly protect oneself from evil spirits or even drive them out. This is key to understanding the real world change that beat writers believe they could enact through their writing holding a sense of optimism, which is now present in the solar punk genre today. Um, beat writers such as Waldman and Ginsberg also engage often in performative utterances. So Austin discussed how we bring certain things into being by writing or saying them, such as I promise. Just as Ginsberg proclaimed, I here declare the end of the war, in his 1966 poem, Wichita Vortex Sutra, imaginatively ending the Vietnam War through speech, Waldman uses performative utterances to rob plutonium of its riches in her film, Uh Oh Plutonium, invoking plutonium as she shouts, I spell away. In Ginsberg Plutonium Ode, which was also written in protest against plutonium's environmental pollution, he writes, I call your name with hollow vowels, I psalm your fate close by, my breath near deathless, ever at your side, spell your destiny, I set this verse prophetic of your mausoleum walls to sell, seal you up eternally with diamond truth, O doomed plutonium. Lines such as these show how the beats claim the power to remake reality through language. This is in many ways a precursor to the way in which solar punk believes in our ability to imagine an alternative future and overturn the pessimistic worldview of what our future might look like. In conclusion, the Beat Generation and other writers and filmmakers from the 1950s to the 1980s can be seen as key precursors to the solar punk genre which we know today. We can take key lessons from the Beat movement in particular for today's solar punk texts. The joy in working with nature, and the rebellion of thinking beyond the structures of capitalist and consumerist mentalities to start. Although solar punk has emerged as its own distinct genre with its own specific concerns, the study of its precursors can help us better understand the spirit of the genre and its direction and meaning today. Thank you. Thank you, that was excellent. Um, and that was, that was so cool to me because the, 
so often when I think people talk about like solar punk precursors in literature and media, they talk about like other kinds of science fiction, right? They talk about cyberpunk, they talk about, you know, the eco-utopian science fiction, and they there's not been anywhere that I've seen this kind of reading of the the beat poets as precursors of solar punk. So that I think this was incredibly cool. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, okay, we're going to again save all questions for the end. Uh, so we're going to jump right into our next speaker. Uh, Lika is a 23-year-old uh, graduate or 23-year-old student about to graduate with a master's degree from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. She studied English linguistics and literature and is hoping to go into publishing. For now, she works at a local bookstore and spends most of her time reading, watching Netflix, or playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and with that, I will pass you all over to Lika. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Case. Uh, like I said, my name is Lika, and uh, my talk is going to be about solar punk fiction and what it can do to potentially help people cope with climate anxiety. Uh, I've chosen the Monk and Robot series by Becky Chambers as a case study for this because I think it's a really interesting example of what solar punk can do. Uh, before we can get to that analysis, though, I have to give you all a little bit of theoretical background. Uh, I will explain briefly what definition of climate anxiety I'm using, and I will discuss a coping strategy that I think solar punk can really contribute to. So first things first, I am basing this definition of climate anxiety largely on research by Pikala Panu and research by Susan Clayton. Uh, and when combining their ideas, climate anxiety can be defined as a psychological phenomenon associated with negative or distressing emotional states, which is significantly related to anthropogenic climate change. Experiences that have been linked to climate anxiety can include feelings of worry, hopelessness, anger, depression, powerlessness, fear, or despair. Uh, it can be caused not only by directly experiencing consequences of climate change, like extreme weather events or climate migration, but also by simply being aware of the threat that climate anxiety uh, or that climate change represents. And in the information age, that means that almost anyone can potentially be affected by climate anxiety. Um, but an important note with that is that there is still a lot of debate about whether or not climate anxiety should be classified officially as an anxiety disorder. Um, but since my expertise is not in psychology, but in literary analysis, I don't want to make any claims as to what the clinical status of climate anxiety should be. So I'll simply refer to it as a psychological phenomenon and use that as a jumping off point to talk about some of the benefits that solar punk might have. With that said, uh, <laughs> there are a number of ways to deal with climate anxiety for those who experience it. Susan Clayton outlines three uh, coping strategies, but emphasizes meaning focused coping as the most effective strategy by far. So that is the strategy that I will focus on, uh, also because it's the strategy that I think solar punk can contribute to most meaningfully. Uh, Meaning-focused coping can be defined as a coping strategy uh, that draws on one's beliefs, values, and goals to elicit positive feelings associated with a stressor. This does not eliminate the negative emotions, but it does buffer the detrimental effect of those emotions on someone's well-being. Uh, a key element of Clayton's definition of the strategy is that meaning-focused coping is grounded in hope. Because by focusing on hope, you attach a positive experience to the thing that is also the point of origin for anxiety. So hope and anxiety both revolve around a potential future. So by emphasizing hope, you are nurturing those positive feelings in association with the future rather than the fear that emerges in response to the threat. And because hope is so central to solar punk, uh, I think that makes it an effective way of practicing meaning-focused coping. So that's the theory out of the way. Uh, so now let's get into the books. I will give a quick overview of the world and plot, uh, but I will do my best to keep it spoiler light. But I don't think it'll be entirely spoiler free, so be warned. Anyways, the story of the Monk and Robot series uh, takes place on a small moon called Panga, where the current human population has created a thriving, sustainable society. But it wasn't always like that. A few hundred years ago, their society looked a lot more like our current one, and with all of its ecologically harmful elements. This era of their history became known as the Factory Age. Uh, and things sort of changed for them when the robots that they used for manufacturing and mass production and all that stuff, uh, when the robots gained consciousness. 
uh, because when when they sort of woke up and expressed that they were unhappy with their situation and that they wished to leave society altogether, the humans respected that decision and completely restructured their society to accommodate the robot's departure. Uh, the humans limited their influence to about 50% of the moon's single continent, and the robots went off to live in the wilderness. Um, and a couple centuries later, there's been no contact between hum humans and robots since the split, and society looks entirely different. Uh, it is in many ways a near utopian world, uh, and there is one major metropolis known simply as the city, and many small villages spread throughout the human territory, and we follow our protagonist Dex through those villages. Uh, Dex is a human tea monk to the god Alale, who is the god of small comforts, and they travel from place to place to perform tea service, which is a therapeutic practice where anyone can come to the tea monk with whatever is on their mind, and the monk listens, maybe provides perspective, or gives advice but mostly serves the person tea and creates a space where someone can sort of take a break and reflect. Um, and Dex is really good at this, uh, but at some point they become dissatisfied with their life as a tea monk and uh, travel into the wilderness impulsively to seek a sense of purpose or worth. They very quickly realize that they are drastically unprepared for the real, wood, the real sort of wilderness experience, uh, but they push through and on that journey, they meet the robot Moscap, uh, because it turns out that many of the robots got together and decided to check in on the humans, not necessarily to rejoin society, but to reestablish contact uh, in some form. Moscap volunteered to reach out first and learn as much as possible about what humans are like now, uh, asking the central question, what do humans need? Uh, and the two of them form an unlikely friendship with Moscap guiding Dex through the wilderness in the first book and Dex doing the same for Moscap in the human world in the second book. So <laughs> with all that said, I want to highlight some parts that I think really embody how solar punk can contribute to meaning focus coping. The main thing is that these books invite the reader to imagine a world or a future where human society is structured sustainably. It provides a really hopeful vision of what the world could look like with a ton of creatively imagined options. Uh, so for example, we come across a village that is built into and between the trees uh, high above the ground in order to protect the ecosystem of the forest floor. There's also a village made mostly out of recycled materials that were pulled out of the rivers when those got cleaned up in order to help the environment sort of recover from the factory age. Uh, we also see creative ways of integrating sustainable energy sources and an appreciation of small skill production and craftsmanship, as well as a focus on repairing items rather than replacing them with new ones. So this all serves as a sort of hopeful vision of a potential future, one with a radically different society, but one in which humanity and the environment could both flourish. Uh, and this allows the reader to attach hope to their conceptualization of the future linking a positive emotion to the idea of the future, which is also usually the source of climate anxiety. Um, and this attachment of a positive experience to the same point of origin as the negative experience is what makes meaning-focused coping work. Uh, and so this example shows that solar punk fiction can do that for people. In that way, or in many ways, these books uh, can function like the tea service that Dex performs. There are big questions that get discussed in the books, like, what the relationship between humanity and nature should look like and what the limits of human influence should be. And to the reader, especially to someone who experiences climate anxiety, they likely have their own thoughts and emotions associated with those questions. And the books show many different perspectives on these matters like, and treat each of those perspectives with compassion and respect. For example, Dex and Moscap visit a community of people who hold the belief that all technology is a slippery slope that leads back to the factory age. So they don't use technology at all and are wary of new innovations because in their opinion, relying on those technologies distance, distances you from the experience of being an animal in this world. And it removes you from the ecosystem and grants you a disproportionate amount of influence over the natural world. But Dex and Moscap also talk to people who use and develop technology 
that is meant to help protect the natural world and aid human flourishing in a way that respects the environment. And these discussions and these different perspectives are further emphasized when Dex and Moscap encounter crown shy trees, which is also where the second book, A Prayer for the Crown Shy, gets its name. Uh, so crown shyness is a real phenomenon where the branches of different trees never overlap or touch each other, uh, creating a canopy with like a little space between each tree. Uh, the central idea behind this is of course the question of how do we know when to stop growing? How do we know how much space is ours to take up? And how do we leave enough space, enough space for everything around us to thrive as well? And these books don't claim to give one answer that really covers everything or is presented as the correct answer. Uh, there are many different perspectives, all given weight and respect. Even when the characters disagree, they still treat each other, each other with respect and compassion. And the text does the same thing for the reader. A space is created for the reader to bring their perspective to the text and where they can sit with those big questions and reflect. Um, these books in that way gently acknowledge the reader's fears and present a wide variety of perspectives from which the reader can take what they wish. Uh, it's a compassionate reading experience grounded most of all in hope. By engaging with the questions that are linked to climate anxiety in a way that centers hope, solar punk fiction ties hope to that same point of origin where the anxiety comes from, which is what meaning focused coping is based on. And that is what solar punk can do for people. And I think that sort of sums up, <laughs> sums up that concept. Um, thank you all for listening. It's, it's a real honor to be here and to be able to talk to you all about this topic. Uh, thanks to Case for hosting the panel and thanks to my fe fellow panelists for their exciting ideas and thank you all for this wonderful experience. Thank you. That was excellent because I, when I read those books, I really felt that sense, this, the sense of what you were saying and you articulated that so perfectly for what and it's like yes of course that's why I was feeling like that when I was reading those books it's because it's it's doing this specific thing so thank you that's excellent and it's yeah just a really you know good way of thinking about solar punk in general right as something that is so it's, it is rooted in the real in a sense. Uh, and I'm going to pass it over to Cheyenne. Cheyenne is a PhD researcher from Adamas University, Kolkata, India. He holds a master's degree in English literature. He researches, researches in the field of science fiction literature, uh, and he's presented his research papers at multiple international conferences, including the UNE conference Uniform in 2023, SASA conference 2023, which is upcoming, uh, Popcorn 2022, which is a great name for a conference. Uh, SUSCONF, SUS Conference 2022, and many more. Uh, and with that, I will pass things over to Shyam. Hey, thanks. So both the talks before me were pretty interesting. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to start on the same note that uh, how it triggered, but rather solar punk is something that I've been discussing from quite, quite of time because uh, I remember by 2019 or 20, when I first came across this very term, solar punk, I was pretty clueless. And so I started uh, searching about it, uh, started reading some books about it. And then what happened was I started questioning. I started questioning that this is a future as well, but is it the future which we are looking into? So with that thought, uh, I've prepared this presentation of mine. I hope uh, this won't be dragged for long. I'll try to just sum up it up. Uh, so how this thing goes, let me give you a brief idea. Uh, every slide of mine uh, has a question. And all of the questions I've tried answering on my own perspective. So. That's how I wish to proceed. So here goes my presentation, which is entitled Solar Punk and Sustainability. 
imagining the future through science fiction because that's uh, the perspective I've tried to give it in. So coming to the idea, what really is solar punk? Could be said that um, it is a rebel, it is um, a subculture that challenges the very established dystopian future. Or you can say uh, that it's sustainable in a way, it's uh, renewal, uh, the renewal energy in it, the ecological harmony it proposes. This makes solar punk different from all the other genres I have studied um, on the terms of futures in science fiction, because they are mostly dystopian, mostly dystopian. It comes or originates from two words, solar, which means the solar energy, and punk, which denotes a subculture that challenges an established idea. So with this, I started to ask that why solar punk and why not any other future? So here, I've got a few understandings of mine. Now see, number one, it's really positive. It's really ecologically balancing the world. It is something that is giving us hope. And while researching in the very field of science fiction, I've seen myself that, you know, it's easier to destroy future than to build one. Solar punk is doing that hard stuff. It's trying to build a future amidst an apocalyptic dystopian scene where probably we all hope that the future uh, is pretty dark, pretty doomed. And expected the judgment day is near. So there, solar punk gives us hope. The well-being of the humanity, of the planet. It deals with not destroying, but with saving everything. So I believe that this solar punk, uh, the philosophy of solar punk could, you know, be one of the possible futures. Moving ahead, I felt that why such future is desirable. The future is good and all that's absolutely cool. But if it's desirable, it should have some reasons, right? So here I have got some points of my own. See, it's all about that positivity. It's all about that optimism towards life, towards a renewable energy, towards the sustaining of life itself. So certain ideas, I found that they could be useful uh, while, you know, excavating this very idea. The first goes uh, environmental imperatives, technological as advancements, economic opportunities, which I feel that uh, in today's world is highly needed. Uh, energy, energy independence, which I believe we could lead up to that future if we, again, uh, quote unquote, are politically moving in such pace. Uh, public health benefits because nature is pretty much mother nature. Uh, uh, social equity and justice, which probably the postmodern society is fighting, thriving for. Then comes the idea that is this future sustainable? The future is there, the reality could, you know, be asked for, but how sustainable this future is? While searching on this very question, I have literally found a very low amount of literature. And I do not know why, but researchers so far on the very philosophy of solar punk or on the movement overall uh, have not studied its sustainability. Everyone has said that it's sustainable. It is going to sustain everything. It's holding up. But the question is how? Also the question is when? So while searching upon all of these questions, I found that probably it is just in a a modern hopeful sense that we could find it sustainable. Probably is a word which I could use while explaining it because I don't see the assurance anywhere. And that's what I found. 
this future could be sustainable, but this future could also be, you know, not sustainable as well, because it's in its very initial stages, as I see. But again, with the power of positivity, let's hope. Then uh, I found out that solar punk is discussing all this environment, discussing all this nature, uh, discussing all this climate hazards. Uh, so how really is climate fiction different from solar punk? Or are they the same? Or are they probably two other terms? So this is what I found, climate fiction versus solar punk. In literature, solar punk is something which resides in two states. The one is pre-apocalypse, where everyone's hopeful that the apocalypse itself won't come, or the earth or the nature won't turn it that way. The second state is a post-apocalyptic state, where the apocalypse has already been done, it's happened, and then the society and then the uh, humanity, it's seeking a renewal of everything. So I saw that solar bunk stays in these two states only. It's not apocalyptic ever. It's rather all positive, which also could trigger questions. Uh, I don't know, but it's always quote unquote positive. Climate fiction on the other hand, or cli-fi on the other hand, uh, it's a bit dystopian. Now, I'm a part of a book club, the climate fiction book club. Uh, there, I discuss climate fiction a lot, at least uh, a month or two, once in a month or two. And you see every discussion, every discussion, we have this dystopia or dystopian term in common. In anyone's discussion, be it mine, be it someone else, uh, everyone's discussion, this dystopia term is so common in like by that it's probably synonymous. Solar punk is synonymous with optimism, with hopes. Probably a utopia that you're looking up to. Cli-fi differs in this way. Although they deal with the same nature, although they deal with the same climate, although they deal with the same hazards, but amidst hazard, solar punk sees hope of rebuilding itself, of sustaining itself, of sustaining the life, of uh, sustaining the nature of reviving the justice that the society had, of reviving the energy that could be renewed. Cli-Fi talks of an apocalypse, a stop to the climate. The climate change is hazardous. Yes, it's real, but Cli-Fi is dystopian. And that's what I found. And then I started reading books. I started understanding what exactly Solar Punk wanted to say, and I know there's a lot of text on the um, page. I'll, I won't suggest you to read all that. I'll just brief it down. So the fifth sacred thing, here an interesting story happens. And as I've said, um, Solar Punk stays in two states. This is a story that happens or occurs in a post-apocalyptic state. So where everything, you know, met apocalypse and then they're hoping for a revival and here interestingly the revival happens on a what i could say coexisting way if i may use it uh, so here the liberation is not just of the humans but also of the nature the nature is being destroyed just because it needs to there's no reason, there's absolutely no sense on why the nature needs to be destroyed, but it just gets destroyed. There's this group that saves or, you know, that practices sustainability, that practices nonviolence, the positive end. And what they want to do is they want to liberate not only themselves, but also the nature from the apocalyptic ruler's hand from the regime, as this novel says. Here, nature could be seen, you know, on a very um, personified way, 
which makes us think about the life of nature, the life of earth, that life is not just in us, but in plants too, in wood too, in things that can't move, in things that can breathe probably. So here's one quote from the book that I loved and that says, the earth is a living conscious being. This made me wonder that shouldn't I read more? And so I went on to my next book, which was New York 2140. It's by Kim Stanley. And this is an interesting plot because this also takes place on a post-apocalyptic state. Here, the New York City, it's completely submerged by flood. And everything that's happening, it is post that situation. In this novel, I've found that people have learned to live this way. They have learned to utilize nature. They have learned to utilize the water around them. They have learned to sustain life. You know, a simple idea which moved me probably is that the concept of how practically we can change if such situation occurs. You know what this, uh, you know about uh, this incident which takes place, the transportation of boats, all right? So now the entire New York is submerged in water, no roads are there. So the only way of transportation is boat. Just think, it's not emitting fuels. It's not emitting any carbon in the sky. The sky is saved. The land is saved. The flora is saved. We are going to such an extent of sustaining stuffs that we are not utilizing much. That's where this novel brings us to. You know, this talks of such a possible future that I was really thinking, well, what if such an apocalypse hits? And you know, probably we can survive that. It's such optimistic. Also one quote from this novel, which I loved, life is bigger than equations, stronger than money, stronger than guns and poison and bad zoning policy, stronger than capitalism, because mother nature bats last and mother ocean is strong and will live inside our mothers forever. And life is tenacious and you can never kill it. You can never buy it. With this thought, I'd move on to my next beautiful solar punk book by Nebi Okurafo. I don't know if I'm spelling that name right, but uh, the book, is called Sunny and the Mysteries of Osisi. Here, it's an interesting story. It basically tells the story of Sunny, a girl possessed with solar upon powers, with, you know, powers uh, that can uh, make everything turn, make everything change. And she is uh, on an adventure, meeting mythical creatures, uh, traveling and you know, discovering stuff. And this journey is to bring or sustain life at the end. It's an adventure, it's a quest where probably she wants to bring, through which she wants to bring sustainability, through which she desires, through which she hopes for a better future. She becomes the nature. She becomes the power that Solar Bang talks of. That's why this book pretty, uh, you know, interesting, um, it's ideologically probably the most solar punkish book that I've came across, ideologically. And then comes one of my favorites. I don't know all that. Um, I could rather fit it into solar punk completely, but yeah, Parable of the Sower by Octavia e. Butler's. Even my review upon this is coming up late this month. Um, Parable of the Sour, or Sower, it's um, technically a cli-fi book, not really a solar punk. But where this drags me is the idea of future, that we uh, have this future. And this future is really not upon others to decide. 
there's this singular fate that we all belong to. And we are the ones who will lead the singular fate to his destiny. So here, again, we see this in a dystopian, uh, I won't say dystopian, it's an apocalyptic state, not post or pre, it's present in an apocalyptic state. But within that apocalyptic state, the protagonists, the organizations, you know, they challenge the very authority. They challenge the authority on the ground of saving Earth. That's where, you know, this thing becomes a bit solar punkish. I have really seen very less cli-fi books that holds the idea of hope at the end. Probably it generates hope after an apocalypse, which really destroys or uh, is leading up to destruction. But I haven't seen such a book, such an apocalyptic book, a cli-fi, where we understand that probably stagnation is nowhere. Stagnation is um, rather not even a thing that fate admits to. And therefore, a pretty famous terminology from the book comes up that change is God or God is change, for which I've written down this quote below. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. God is change. So is this God that is changing a apocalyptic or a dystopian state to a post-apocalyptic slash utopic state? Is this God a solar punk? Then I have started questioning that if God could be solar punk, then how real is God? And if God can't be real, how real is a solar punk future then? Then I got the answer that a solar punk future could be real. It's not something that is unachievable. It is something that rather we could achieve. But there's a lot of political hinges. There's a lot of uh, social hinges. You see, I've told earlier that changing future or building future is way difficult than destroying a future. And we being humans, our genetic uh, what I could say, uh, our genetic way of approaching is we choose the easier path. So I really feel that if we do try hard, which some of us are doing, if we do try hard, real hard, a solar pump future could be a real future. But can we really call it future or is it already happening then as i see as we have you know solar punk conference i really am thinking that probably it's not that future anymore and in sci-fi we see this a lot that future is nothing but a day or two ahead of us so from that perspective i'm telling that we are already working up on solar pump, we are already having this habit of changing. We are already enriching minds to change. In the postmodern era, there are no facts. There are movements that either die or either stay for a real long time. Solar pump is here to stay because it stayed for a real long time. And I believe that policies, government policies, if you could change it politically, then probably a solar pump future would be present and not future. With that, I would take my leave. I was Shyam, and you can reach out to me on the details present here. You could just take a screenshot if you want to reach me out. And yeah, that's all from my end.